Yeah, I think a lot of dairy producers are already aware that heat stress has been a problem for the dairy industry that negatively impacts production. And it's something that isn't going to go away. So it's something that's really top of mind for people. And they're aware that there can be this production impacts. But as an animal welfare specialist, I also try to get people to think about the cattle's experience because dairy cattle are sentient. And it's something that many people, including our potential dairy consumers, care about, even if they're not aware of the specific issue of heat stress. So hello, everyone. This is Luis Ferrero with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we'll be discussing about how important heat abatement is for cows. And in order to understand that, we have Dr. Jennifer Van Oss, which is an assistant professor here at UW-Madison, one of my colleagues for research and extension. And Jennifer will be teaching us everything about how can we do a proper job with heat abatement. So Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, but before we get into this discussion, could you please give us a brief background about yourself? Yeah, so thanks so much, Luis, for having me. It's, it's so exciting to talk to you today about this. And my position, as Luis mentioned, is that I'm also an applied researcher and extension specialist, but my area of focus is dairy cattle welfare. And my PhD is in animal behavior. And I think it's really important that the work we do in my lab tries to address real world problems that dairy farmers face. And so I use a combination of biological approaches, primarily animal behavior outcomes, but also social science to try to understand the perspectives of all the people who are interested in dairy cattle welfare. So my goal in my lab is to use this applied research to try to help the dairy industry be the best and continue to improve as we learn more from scientific research. So Jennifer, guide us a little bit through why it's so important to have a good system to mitigate heat stress? Yeah, I think a lot of dairy producers are already aware that heat stress has been a problem for the dairy industry that negatively impacts production. And it's something that isn't going to go away. So it's something that's really top of mind for people. And they're aware that there can be this production impacts. But as an animal welfare specialist, I also try to get people to think about the cattle's experience because dairy cattle are sentient. And it's something that many people, including our potential dairy consumers, care about, even if they're not aware of the specific issue of heat stress. And so what's interesting is I think in the industry, sometimes we throw around the term heat stress and it can mean a lot of different things. And sometimes people equate it to thermo neutrality. And I went back and I found a paper that's over 50 years old. It was Bianca 1968. <laughs> and I think that his philosophy actually aligns with mine more thinking about animal welfare, where Thermo neutrality has a really specific definition, and that's the range of ambient conditions in which an animal doesn't have a change in their metabolic heat production, whether it's cold or heat. And so if you look at Bianca's diagram, which I really like, he talks about how if we think about thermal comfort, which I think is more equivalent to thinking about animal welfare. So what is the animal subjectively experiencing? That's actually a narrower range. And the way he defined it is, at least in terms of um, hot conditions, is once the animal's natural adaptations start to activate, so there's physiological adaptations and behavioral adaptations, we can list those in a minute, that's the sign that the animal is now trying to cope with conditions that are uncomfortable. And that's where it relates to animal welfare. And that can happen even in what we would consider thermoneutral conditions. So uh, from my perspective, we need to be thinking about thermal discomfort sooner than when we see these production deficits. And so I think heat stress is something people are already really aware of, but I like to ask people to shift their perspective and think about, well, what is the animal feeling, even if she isn't losing production yet? Absolutely. And I think this is a great point because um, a couple of years ago, I attended a conference uh, and and basically uh, an extension conference. And basically people were discussing about how we focus a lot on THI numbers and, and that are we really doing a good job with that? Because the cows nowadays, they produce way more milk than before, right? So it's a completely different metabolism. So I even believe that there is uh, probably a lower 
threshold that we have to think about, which basically tells you that, hey, we actually have to pay very close attention to that because if you're talking about high producing cows, there are a lot of uh, potential issues that we can induce to those cows. Uh, but but you, you mentioned how important that is, how we should be careful about the concept itself. But if you think about strategies to cool down cows or make sure we don't reach whatever the threshold that we decide to consider for heat stress, what are our options? And do we have to consider options differently depending on where we are? For example, here in Wisconsin compared to other uh, warmer places or that different humidity and so on? Absolutely. You, you gave uh, raised a lot of issues. You're giving me a lot of things to think about at once. But yeah, with THI, the temperature humidity index, that accounts for air temperature or dry bulb temperature as well as relative humidity. And I think it can be a useful rule of thumb, depending on your production system, right? If cows are grazing outside and they're exposed to solar radiation, which can increase their heat load, or natural wind speed, which can reduce the heat load, then there's other factors to take into account. So there are other indexes besides THI. And even with THI, there are many, many different formulas. So like you said, some of the most common calculations are many decades old and don't necessarily account for the thresholds of our modern high producing cows. But even then, I think that THI can be useful for forecasting. So we can look ahead at the weather forecast and decide this is when we need to monitor and perhaps uh, look out for these warning signs. But I think the best thing to do is to measure the cattle's responses directly. And that's because we know that there's individual variation. So even in the same environment, same barn, different individual cattle can respond differently. And, and also the microclimate inside the barn is sometimes different than the outside conditions. And so there's multiple things I'm thinking about. And one is what you raised that with the THI thresholds, it also depends what's your outcome variable of interest. So traditionally, some of these THI thresholds that people throw around like 72 or 68, these are based on breakpoints in milk production. So an abrupt change in milk production, depending on the THI. And I think that's something that resonates a lot with producers. But by the time the cow is losing milk production, it's kind of too late. You've already experienced this cascade of negative consequences. Although from the cow's perspective, that's actually adaptive. Reducing milk production is both a consequence and a mechanism for her to reduce her heat load and try to maintain her body temperature in a normal range. So instead, our departmental colleague, Dr. Jimena Laporta, has calculated some breakpoints based on other outcomes, also depending on the region. So a subtropical climate like Florida or a continental climate like Wisconsin, cattle are going to respond differently in those environments and also adapt a bit differently. But one thing that I like that she did was using some of these earlier indicators that I hinted at earlier. So instead of waiting until there's a loss in production for cows or growth in calves, looking at these early physiological responses that indicate the animal is trying to cope, which I think equates to this thermal discomfort. So one indicator that I like to use is respiration rate, because this is one of the early coping mechanisms, these adaptive mechanisms that cows and calves use. And so we can calculate these breakpoints and we see that the thresholds for when respiration rate abruptly changes is earlier than when, when we lose milk production. So I think that monitoring respiration rate lets us know, okay, the animals are trying to cope. They're starting to feel uncomfortable. This is when we can better make these decisions about when to intervene with heat abatement. Looking to maximize your herd's potential? Elevate performance with Kemen's cutting edge encapsulation technologies, including rumen protected choline, methionine, and lysine. Kemen's advanced choline and amino acid technologies ensure precise nutrient delivery, boosting milk yield and enhancing herd health. Trust Kemen, the experts in encapsulation, to take your herd to the next level. Learn more today at kemen.com forward slash dairy. Absolutely. No, for sure. I think that respiration rate can give us a very good hint. And obviously, right, uh, depending on where you are, people, uh, for me in Brazil, for example, many years ago, we used to see cows that they reach a point where they already have their tongue out of their mouths, right? We don't want to get there. Right. That, that would be severe panting. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's for sure. So after paying attention to those uh, conditions and understanding that it's about time to start with all the abatement, what are our options? What is out there and how do you make an informed decision about how to ensure cows receive the best of the best equipment that is available out there? 
Yeah. So when we're thinking about relieving heat stress or thermal discomfort, it's this balancing act between the heat that the animal's body is producing and then the heat that they're gaining from the environment that then they try to dissipate that heat. And so the first line of defense would be shade to prevent heat gain from solar radiation. So depending on your region or your production system, for many producers, that's a given. Their animals are under the cover of a barn, but in grazing systems or dry lots, sometimes the animals don't have any or as much shade. So I would say shade is stage one to prevent that heat gain. And then we can think about mechanisms that help the animal reduce the amount of heat that they're producing and then reduce the amount of heat that they're gaining from the environment. And again, that will depend on the region and what kind of resources farmers have available to them. So here in Wisconsin in a continental climate, I'm a big fan of Haha, <laughs> no pun intended, actually. I'm a big fan of starting with fans, whereas in some other regions, I think soakers might be more appropriate or can be supplemented with those fans. So I think I'd like to tell you a bit about some of the studies we did here in Wisconsin with fans for adult cows. Yeah, that would be great. So, Jennifer, thank you so much for bringing all this uh, information today. I'm sure people at home uh, have a lot to think about. Uh, And for you at home, thanks for joining. And keep in mind that we will continue this discussion uh, for another episode uh, with Jennifer so we can continue to explore all those different effects associated with heat stress and dairy cows. So thanks again for joining us and I hope to see you soon. Hey, everyone. We are always searching for the latest and greatest research to share weekly. If you have a dairy nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details of your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Thank you and hope to see you soon.